Hi everybody, this is the lecture to accompany chapter 10 in your textbook. Please read chapter 10 carefully. There's lots of information in there that I don't have time to address in this lecture. Okay, let's talk about leadership. Our case study this chapter revolves around Terry Ann, who really wanted to participate in the leadership of her college's service club. But after she was elected president, it became obvious that she really didn't understand her role and had no idea how to be a leader. She allowed herself to feel intimidated by members with more seniority and was afraid to ask for help or designate jobs to anyone. But you can't just take a leadership role and expect that everything will happen the way it's supposed to. It takes an understanding of what leadership is and a willingness to put that knowledge into practice. It also takes an understanding of different leadership styles and when they're most effective. Your leadership must match what the group wants, needs, and expects. The first thing you need to do is understand what leadership is. When we think of a leader, our default idea is that a leader is a person in charge and that there's generally just one leader in a group. Well, guess what? Nothing could be further from the truth. Every member in a group provides some kind of leadership because leadership is any behavior that directs the group to its goal. Hackman and Johnson define leadership as the use of communication to modify attitudes and behaviors of group members to meet group goals and needs. So this implies three things. First, that leadership is accomplished through effective communication. Second, leadership is that which helps the group achieve its shared goals. And third, good leadership is adaptable. It allows for changing conditions. Leadership is a dynamic process. Leadership is based on influence, which is the use of personal power to modify the actions and attitudes of members. Let's look at the different kinds of personal power we have, and that might help you understand why every group member has potential leadership skills. First, there's legitimate power. This is generally what we think of when we think of leadership, having to do with title or position. If you're the chair of a committee or the president of an association, whether you were appointed or elected to that position, by default, that gives you leadership power or the ability, right, and responsibility to influence other people. In the case study, Terri Ann didn't realize that her position as president gave her the right and the responsibility to ask group members to do things like take meeting minutes or do tasks. Then there's reward or punishment power. These are two sides of the same coin. This comes from someone's perceived ability to give others what they want or take things away from people. A child might see a parent's power as reward or punishment. For instance, the parent has the ability to give the child an allowance for completing chores and the ability to withhold that allowance if the chore isn't done. As your instructor, I have the ability to give you a good grade for a job well done and a poor grade for a not so well done job. I do it without coercion, which is an, an extreme form of punishment involving threats or force, because that's generally an inappropriate and unethical tactic. So don't you do it either. Someone might have expert power, which comes from the fact that they have some valuable knowledge, experience, or skill that's necessary for the completion of the task. For instance, a group in a previous small group communication class had a member who was a whiz at video editing. They relied on her to put together their video for the last assignment, and it was indeed great. Then there's reference power, which comes from likability and being admired by others. This can be a good thing if the person with the reference power is actually using that to guide the group to its goal. But if they're using their personal charm and charisma to cause problems, as the example in the text about the girl who talked all her friends into ditching high school and then they all got caught, the results of following a person with strong referent power can be problematic. So you need to make sure that person has the best interest of the group in mind and not their own best interest. Information power comes from someone who has control over the dissemination of information. The person with this power may have the information itself or know where the information is and how to access it. If a leader is the only source of information and refuses to provide it to the members or only gives certain information and keeps other information away from them, this can impact the ability of the group to meet its goal. 
And finally, there's ecological power. This stems from someone's ability to control the physical environment and the work processes of the group. Having the power to decide where the group meets, how the room is arranged, who's doing what during the group meetings, this is actually a form of power. The case study examples show that Terry Ann didn't use this power to organize the group's processes and the group suffered as a result. So I hope you can see that there are many ways to be a leader. You don't have to be the president to have leadership abilities. All of us can and should take on leadership roles. So by its very definition, all individuals in a group can and should supply some of the needed leadership to that group. Any member of a group, with or without a title, can at times function as its leader. If you perform leadership behaviors, you're leading the group and helping it to reach its goal. Now when I say that, I don't mean that there should be a constant power struggle among the group members as to who's leading whom. That would be counterproductive. What I mean is that everyone helps the group reach its goal, and effective leadership is part of that process. Good communication is the key. There are two types of leaders in groups. A designated leader is someone who's been elected or appointed as leader, and the other people in the group recognize that person's identity as the leader. In your groups, you're going to designate a moderator for your group identity project, and that person will be the leader of your group for that assignment. Then, for your problem-solving panel discussion, you're going to designate another moderator who will be the leader for that assignment. There's also another kind of leader, an emergent leader. This is someone who starts out at the same level as everyone else, but through their abilities and communication skills, emerges as an informal leader. While all members initially have the potential to be leaders, there are particular positive attributes that emergent leaders possess. The people who speak up are good self-monitors who can adapt their behaviors to the group needs. They listen and pay attention to what's happening in the group. They're extroverted and sociable, open-minded, verbal, and intelligent. People with these characteristics tend to be seen as leaders. So what's going to make sure you're not seen as a leader? Well, members who don't speak up, who are intentionally uninformed, in other words, they don't do their homework, or are overly bossy. Yes, being bossy can eliminate you as a potential boss. Or are dogmatic. Dogmatic means you're inflexible and you can't or won't see things from another person's perspective. In one of my previous classes, I had a student who had led other groups at their job and simply assumed that they were going to be the leader of this group. But their insistence on being right all the time and general bossiness ended up working against them. The other members of the group resented this person, and it brought down the group's ability to work towards their goal. Although in the past men were seen as leaders more than women, it really isn't the case anymore. Biological sex is not an indicator of leader emergence, and groups generally tend to select leaders based on performance and leadership abilities, not gender. The prevailing stereotypes out in the world about leaders are that they control the actions of group members, that they give orders and basically tell people what to do. But as we've seen, those things are not true, at least not in the case of effective leaders. Let's look at some of these myths. Myth one, leadership is a personality trait that individuals possess in varying degrees. No, there's not one set of traits that all leaders hold, and there's not one set of traits that's needed in every leadership situation. And these traits don't necessarily just naturally exist within a person. There are leadership skills that can be learned. Myth two, there is an ideal leadership style no matter the situation. There isn't an ideal leadership style. When we get to the next slide, table 10.2, and we'll discuss the different types of leadership styles and the situations in which each style might work best. And finally, myth three, leaders get other people to do the work for them. Leaders, good, effective leaders anyway, don't spend their time telling other people what to do and getting them to do their work for them. And frankly, just telling someone what to do doesn't ensure that the job's going to get done anyway. A good leader leads. She doesn't command. So let's talk a little bit about the different kinds of leadership styles. The three main ones are autocratic, democratic, and laissez-faire. 
Autocratic style is where the person in charge makes all the decisions with very little or no input from other group members. This is a task-focused style that sacrifices interpersonal relationships in order to get the job done. This is the just do what I say and do it right type of leader. They're not often well-liked, but the group say lead can be productive if the person knows what they're doing and if the goal is all that matters. Democratic style leaders are the opposite of autocratic. They want everyone to participate in the group decisions and tasks. They actively seek out everyone's ideas, often resulting in a lot more group satisfaction. These groups tend to be more committed to the group's goals and more creative and innovative in their solutions. Laissez-faire leaders are ones who are more hands-off style, which, depending on the motivation of the other group members, might work out okay. Unfortunately, laissez-faire leaders often don't do much leading at all, and if others are looking to them to make decisions, they're out of luck. Groups run like this often waste a lot of time because nothing gets done. Sometimes an emergent leader will get the group back on track. Sometimes the group just flounders. Then there are three styles that organizational and management experts often talk about, transactional, transformational, and charismatic. Transactional leaders are those who are adept at trading or exchanging one resource for another, as in a politician who asks your vote in exchange for supporting a local project. That's the way they get a lot of things done. Transformational leaders, often called visionary leaders, are those who seem to be able to inspire other people to support a common goal that's really bigger than any one individual goal. Steve Jobs was that kind of leader. And charismatic leaders are those whose personal characteristics and qualities are perceived to be so special that they inspire people to follow them simply because of who their audiences perceive them to be, whether they actually have those qualities or not. While this can be good, as in someone like Gandhi, it can also be bad, as in someone like David Koresh, the leader of the Branch Davidians religious cult, who proclaimed himself to be God and ended up with him and most of his followers dead following a firefight with the FBI. So be careful with someone who seems to be so charismatic that you find yourself pulled into everything they say. They could be trouble. Now that you know that leadership isn't one style, it doesn't involve bossing people around, and it isn't a trait that exists inside of a person, let's look at what leadership does involve, the pragmatic, practical things that leaders do in the group to help everyone work toward the goal. We will discuss three approaches to leadership, the functional concept, the contingency concept, and distributed leadership. The functional concept says that there are essential functions that must be carried out in order for the group to function effectively, and that all group members are responsible for making sure these things happen, because no one person can do them. So task-related functions like determining the task, offering suggestions, creating agendas, researching, keeping the group on task, and people-related functions like harmonizing, supporting, relieving tension should be performed by all group members. The leader oversees this process, identifies what is needed, and either provides those things him or herself or delegates someone to provide them. In the contingency concept of leadership, appropriate leadership behavior depends on the situation. For instance, while the laissez-faire, hands-off style of leadership tends not to work well generally, if your group is full of seasoned professionals who know exactly what they're doing, it could actually be the right leadership style. Leaders look at several factors before deciding how to proceed, the maturity and knowledge level of the group, what the task is, and how well the members work together. Based on this, the leader may decide to either tell, give specific instructions, sell, give instructions, and then support those instructions, participate, which means to facilitate, or delegate, which means to give the responsibility to members in the group. The more interested, experienced, and motivated the group members are, the less direction and input is required by the leader. Finally, distributed leadership is based on the idea we discussed before that all group members can and should provide leadership in the group. It acknowledges that leaders and members directly influence each other. It's a very democratic leadership dynamic, and it can lead to greater productivity, but it can sometimes lead to tension as the group seeks to figure out when the leader should be more controlling and when the group can be in control. Lots of groups in the work world use this style. 
So, in general, what do good leaders actually do? First, they help to establish the group's goal, that everyone understands and supports the goal, and sets the standards of expectations for the group as they work toward that goal. Then they help to mold the members into a team. They understand that group members need to trust and support each other and help them to work collaboratively. They keep their eye on the task and the work required to reach the goal and monitor the progress made by the group on the task. They encourage all the members of the group to assume leadership responsibilities. And most importantly, they don't take the job for granted. They're constantly trying to improve their leadership skills. So what are the specific things that designated leaders, moderators, do within the group? There are three major functions that leaders are expected to perform. First, administrative duties. Generally, designated leaders plan what will happen at meetings by creating an agenda, which is a list of the items that the group will need to discuss and decide on. Then, during the meeting, someone should be designated to take minutes. Minutes are notes about the outcome of those discussions and decisions. It can be the leader that takes the minutes, but ideally it should be somebody else. The leader is also responsible for following up to make sure things talked about at the meetings actually occur. During meetings, they initiate discussions about topics and encourage interaction and participation as members talk about the ways to reach the goal and complete the task. They stick to the agenda and structure the discussion so that everything gets talked about. And of course, the job of a leader is to help develop the group's trust level, teamwork, and cooperation. Now, the textbook goes into much more detail about these specific functions than I have time to get into here, so please read that carefully. The gist of it is that a leader is not someone who orders people around. A leader is someone who serves the group to make sure it has what it needs to succeed. Because the benefits of encouraging distributed leadership within the group outweigh the challenges, let's talk about the ways to help all group members take on some of the leadership responsibilities. As a leader, you should be perceptive and analyze the needs of the group. Be willing to adapt your behavior to the group's needs. Always keep at least one eye on the task. Although the social aspects of the group are important, helping the group keep on task is equally important. While you should take an interest and contribute, don't talk all the time. You need to balance participating with listening. When you talk, express your ideas clearly. The more you understand about the way groups work, the more effective you're going to be. Make sure if you're the designated leader, you know how to run a meeting. Remember, in distributed leadership, you are all influencing each other in order to reach the goal. So planning is good, improvising is important, and adapting to changing circumstances is vital. Remember, the essence of leadership is using influence and power in the right, most ethical way. As a group leader, you need to follow these ethical guidelines. Do not lie intentionally. Truth should be the standard for the group's decision-making processes. Subject all ideas to the standard of truth and honesty. When it comes to the group, you need to place the group's concerns ahead of your own. Don't take advantage of your position as leader for personal gain or advantage. Be kind. Never intentionally ridicule or insult someone. Build trust. Encourage participation. Stand behind and support members as they do their assigned work within the group. Treat everyone with equal respect, regardless of gender, ethnicity, or social background. Help establish clear policies and rules about how the group will proceed. And follow those rules yourself. Be an example to the other group members. I hope you can see that every member of the group has the ability and the responsibility to be a leader not a boss, a leader, capable of influencing, teaching, encouraging, and supporting the other group members as you all work towards the goal. This is the end of the lecture on Chapter 10.